In this video, we begin chapter two, atoms, molecules, and ions, which is of course important in chemistry, right? Because it's responsible for the entire world around us, including you, the identity for your body. Comes down to the atoms, molecules, and ions that make you up. So we've got seven sub chapters within chapter two, and we'll have a video for each of them, including this one where we cover 2.1. And the idea as we go throughout this is to learn how to speak the language of chemistry. As we get into those latter videos, we're gonna start learning how to use chemical symbols. Right? Those are the letters that will make up words to formulas. And then we move on to later things like sentences in chemical equations in later chapters. Yep. So some of these ideas will seem still like review. Some of them overlap with chapter one, but other places in this chapter, we may start to get new ideas from what you've seen in chemistry in the past. So let's jump into 2.1, early ideas in atomic theory. Okay. And this brings us to the ideas of how the atom was first brought into existence, I guess, for lack of a better way to say it. They've always existed, but how the idea came to be. Uh, and atoms were first proposed by the Greeks, all right, which we talked about this in chapter one, it comes from atomos, indivisible. It's right? the smallest possible thing you can get while still maintaining a unique chemical identity. Okay. Then we've got some later work by Aristotle. Right? That gave us the four different elements, earth, air, fire, and water. But what we're gonna focus on in this video is in the 1800s when John Dalton proposed his atomic theory, which consisted of five postulates that might seem familiar to you. Let's jump into those, the postulates of Dalton's atomic theory. Yep. Here are the first two. So this matter is composed of exceedingly small particles called atoms, right? You probably knew that. Atom is the smallest unit of an element that can participate in a chemical change. And that is the key idea, participate in a chemical change, okay? Because we're not talking about things like protons, neutrons, and electrons. Postulate two, an element consists of only one type of atom. And so if you've got an element, anything that's on the periodic table, it's just made up of one type of atom. Okay. And everything in there has a mass that's characteristic of the element, and it's the same for all atoms of the element. Okay. And we'll find out what that boils down to a little bit later. If we look at copper, for example, looking at early pennies, right, because modern pennies are copper-coated zinc, but early pennies were pure copper. So if we look at it in the atomic scale, right, it's just copper atoms, ignoring any impurities that might be in there. Other postulates, three, four, and five. Right? Atoms of one element differ in properties from atoms of all other elements. Right? Of course, that's why we have different elements on the periodic table. And then we talked about postulate four a little bit in chapter one. A compound, which is different from an element, consists of two or more elements combined in a small, whole number ratio. That's another key idea, the whole number ratio. So for whatever compound we're dealing with, the number of atoms of each element are always present in the same ratio. It might be one to one, might be one to two, might be two to three, but it's always the same ratio throughout. Okay. And lastly, atoms are neither created nor destroyed during a chemical change, but instead rearranged to yield a different type of matter, which we already know from chapter one, right? the law of conservation of matter. So if we look at something like copper two oxide, right, here we have a compound where it maintains the same ratio throughout the sample, one copper to one oxygen in copper two oxide. And by the end of this chapter, we'll learn where that name comes from. So the law of conservation of matter I just talked about, right, that was the first law you're responsible for learning in chapter one. That one should already be in your back pocket. And so I'm not gonna spend any time here on slide number nine. But what I do want to talk about, which we'll finish this video on, are two other laws that you're responsible for knowing from chapter one. Okay. We have the law of definite proportions, okay. also known as the law of constant composition, two different names that mean the same thing. Law of definite proportions, law of constant composition. Okay. That tells us that all samples of a pure compound contain the same elements in the same proportion. We got that from Dalton's atomic theory, okay, which was confirmed by later experiments from Joe Proust. 
So if we have the same compound, it always ends up having the same ratio of the elements that are in there. But a key thing, right, the inverse is not necessarily true. Uh, this doesn't maintain a chemical identity because different things can have the same ratio but be different compounds, okay? So don't try and use it both ways. Just know that for a given pure compound, it always maintains the same constant composition throughout, same definite proportion of those elements. And then we also have the law of multiple proportions. Okay? That tells us that when two elements react to form more than one compound, so there's several different compounds that they can form, right, a fixed mass of one element will react with the masses of the other element in a ratio of small whole numbers. So this doesn't contradict the law of definite proportions that we just saw. It builds on it. This is telling us that we can have things come together in multiple different ratios. So we could have something that's one to one and another one that's one to two. Taking these two laws together, those two different proportions, all it's saying is they are different compounds, that's okay, and they both maintain their own unique ratio throughout. And the example that we see here is copper and chlorine, okay? Because copper can form a solid copper chloride called copper one chloride, actually, where it's one copper to one chlorine, and that maintains a mass ratio of 0.558 to one. Whereas we can have copper two chloride, where it's one copper to two chlorines, and then a mass ratio of one gram of copper to 1.116 grams of chlorine, right? So it's a two to one ratio overall. One, right, they're different compounds, different proportions, right? They both maintain the same. This one's one to one, this one's one to two, that agrees with the law of definite proportions. The law of multiple proportions is just telling us that that's okay, right? They can form different ratios when they form different compounds. And this is what those two look like. Okay. Here we see one to one copper to chlorine and over here one to two copper to chlorine. So wrapping up section 2.1, right, we have the law of conservation of matter. You have to know that, that's from chapter one and two now. Uh, atoms are neither created nor destroyed, they just change. Right? We have the law of definite proportions, which isn't shown on this slide, but it ties in, as we just discussed, with the law of multiple proportions, ratio of small whole numbers. Uh, and now we're going to use these ideas in the next video to think about how we move from this early basic understanding to the advances in chemistry that we have today.